Have you ever felt like you've tried everything to heal from the pain of sexual abuse and yet nothing seems to really be helping? Well, one of the reasons why most people struggle to break free from the pain of past child abuse is because the techniques out there are positioned as a one-size-fits-all answer. What I want you to know is that there are actually three distinct phases on the path to recovery. And I'd love to share with you about these phases, what issues you must resolve to move to the next phase, and what kinds of support you'll need in order to move forward as quickly and completely as possible. The road to recovery is much easier when you know what stage you're in and what to do next. So don't hesitate. Go to www.rachelgrantcoaching.com slash checklist and get your nine-page guide today. Now, on to our show. Welcome everyone to Beyond Surviving, the safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to receive support, resources, and share their stories. Beyond Surviving is about freedom, healing, connection, and even laughter and fun. Most importantly, it's about letting go of the pain of abuse and finally moving on. I'm Rachel Grant, and for those of you who don't yet know me, I'm a sexual abuse recovery coach and I've been doing this work since 2007. I'm also the author of Beyond Surviving, The Final Stage of Recovery from Sexual Abuse. I work with survivors who are sick and tired of feeling broken and unfixable, and I help, and I help them let go of the past and move on with their lives. You can learn more about me and the Beyond Surviving program at rachelgrantcoaching.com. Now, today we are in for a treat, folks. You know I love my guests, but I love this guest, like love, love, love. Donna Jensen is here with us today, and she is going to be sharing with us about her own journey of healing and the book that she wrote about it. So I want to tell you a little bit more about Donna. She founded Time to Tell in 2009 with a mission to spark stories from lives affected by incest and sexual abuse to be told and heard. She wrote and performs a one-woman play. I love this. It's so amazing that she's taken her story and put it on stage. The name of her play is What She Knows, One Woman's Way Through Incest to Joy, which is based forms her play at conferences for organizations focused on boys who have sexually abused others, girls in prison, college students, domestic violence and sexual assault advocates, and communities in need of healing. I, we can't, I can't even keep track of this woman. She's all over the place. She's doing so much. And it's just amazing the level of advocacy that she has taken on in her life and the healing that she's brought to so many people. She also has a Time to Tell What We Know writing and mindfulness workshop for survivors. That's so huge, right, folks? When we find our time, when it's time and we want to share our story, having some structure and guidance around how to do that in a safe, healthy, and empowered way is so wonderful. She's also a leader and a counselor and an, an ignore organizer who built grassroots women's centers <clears throat> excuse me, in New York City during the 70s and 80s. See, she's an, an ignored organizer who built grassroots women's centers <clears throat> excuse me, in New York City during the 70s and 80s. See, she's a badass, right? I mean, we could talk to her for hours. She has so much to tell us. Um, and by the way, she's also written a book, Healing My Life from Incest to Joy which is a narrative of the choices she made and experiences she had that helped her heal from abuse. So without further ado, Donna, welcome. We are so glad to have you here today. Rachel, thank you. And I'm going to take this introduction of yours and have it blast in my office at least once a week. And what a <laughs> jolt of infusion of uh, joy and affirmation. My God, I feel like <laughs> 10 times bigger than I actually am right now. <laughs> 
Oh, my goodness, that's yeah. lovely. Well, yeah. I knew a while ago, um, as you were, you know, right at the beginning of, you know, publishing your book and getting all of that, mm. you know, kind of going. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about what inspired you to write your story and to publish, you know, your book. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, I I have a one woman show that I which I wrote uh, back. I started writing that in two thousand, and um, so I was doing a lot. I was just doing the performance of the play, and I would I had a program for the play when people would come to see it, and at the on the back of every program we would research local resources for people having come to the show that they might want to seek out counseling and support mm. and so forth. And so, you know, and then I thought, well, you know, maybe I should do a little resource booklet, you know. I thought, well, you know, maybe I should do a little resource booklet, you know, yeah. to hand out at the play. And, you know, maybe eight or ten pages. And that kind of stuck in the back of my head, you know, have a giveaway for, for people to come. And then my daughter saw the play, and she said, Mom, you have to write a book that explains how you healed enough to write and perform your play. Wow. So I wanted to kick her out of my kitchen and think it's a silly, <laughs> ridiculous thing. <laughs> but then I, you know, I kind of mulled over that for a couple of years, and then I finally said, okay, I'm going to do it. And... Um, it's so funny because I figured, well, you know, this is going to take take about a year and a half. Well, three years to write the first draft mm, and then yeah. another two for editing and, you know, polishing and so forth. So, and then last fall, so, and then last fall it was finally after it was done and published, so. Yeah, That's congratulations. Kind of I love that. The start of it all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So what happened? I'm curious what happened in that year from the moment when the, the idea kind of got planted by your daughter mm, and then that mm. moment a year later where you finally were able to say, yes, I'm doing this. Was there any mm. like key thing that shifted or happened for you that that made that possible? Well, I you know, I think it was doing doing my performance in lots of different venues, like you mentioned, um, and people would come up to me and, you know, have lots of questions. And mm. I just realized that I've got to do, I've got to do this book. I've got to get it down. And so that's really. Yeah, that was the impetus yeah. for it. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And well, and I can certainly relate to like, okay, this will be like about. Mm. In fact, it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. I went through something right. similar writing mm. my book, and you know, sometimes, I, I bet, yeah. yeah, yeah, it takes longer. What do you What do you remember being like the hardest part about writing your book? Right. Well, I would say the hard, definitely the hardest part was I have a section. It's it's divided into four sections, and um, the second section, no, the third section is on relationships. In mm. fact, and I, <laughs> I thought it was going to be one chapter, and it's five. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and and the, the the this section is called the good, the bad, and the ugly because, you know, I, um, my trauma happened inside a relationship. It was with my father, mm -hmm. and I came to understand that the way I was going to fully heal had to be through relationships. Mm. And so all that I gave in and out through that difficult relationships were the hardest, you know, and yeah. shoring up all of that again. Luckily, I also have a whole ton of wonderful healing relationships that I could sort of weave in and out through that, that section, which, mm. you know, sort of kept my head above water, I might say. Yeah, uh, but but writing about the you know the all the difficulties with my biological family, uh, not just the, the the initial hurts, but the awful ways that they the, the ways they just could not deal with the truth. Yeah, um, it was tough stuff, and you got to kind of relive it when you rewrite it. Yeah, when you write it, you know. But, so I'd Thank say that you. was the hardest yeah, part of the Yeah, that section. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know, yeah. that, that brings to mind to me something that's actually been really up for me lately in my communities mm. and, and just on my mind, which is that, re- you know, relationship. And my mom talked about the relationship with mom, right? Mm. And then that brought mm. in other conversations as well. There's been quite a few posts in my, you know, Facebook group about, um, mm. you know, family members not, you know, believing me or not standing by right. me. Um, right. I, I'd love to hear kind of your perspective about that like how where Hmm. are you at today when it comes to you know your relationship with your family and and Hmm. how did you Hmm. how did you get there how did you navigate that are there any key things that you could share that might be of help to our listeners yep well the the big word for all of it is it stinks (laughs) yeah Yeah. right off it really stinks it really does and uh Uh, My family is like many survivor families. Uh, They couldn't, they just couldn't embrace it. Uh, They couldn't hold the truth. It was just too impossible for them. Each for them couldn't embrace it. Uh, They couldn't hold the truth. It was just too impossible for them. Each for their own particular reason. Mm. Um, And... It took me a long time to come out to my family. Um, I was um, in my 40s before I came out Hmm. um, Mm -hmm. for lots of reasons and mostly for self-protection because I knew, you know, uh, the the blank was going to hit the fan (laughs) when when I finally would come out. Uh, Although what happened was very different than what I expected. The people I expected to be there weren't there. You know, so mm-hmm. that was, there were a lot of big surprises. But the thing I talk about a lot in my book and what saved my soul is that along with all the time leading up to my, these are people who love me very well and I love back and they are new sisters and brothers, aunties and uncles, you know, that, that kind of level of closeness without sharing bloodlines. And if I hadn't had that family of choice surrounding me, coming out would have been doubly Mm. hard. Mm -hmm. So I really, really push and advocate for bringing in close anybody that you feel really understands and cares about you. Mm -hmm. Because... You need you need them when you go through this jungle of coming yeah. out, you know. And I I think it's well worth it the coming out, but I know I probably would have felt it would have taken longer, it would have hurt more, it would have taken bigger amounts of sort of therapeutic work to get over it, get over the reaction if I hadn't had my family of choice. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And a couple of questions, like I'm, you know, a million mm-hmm. questions are actually coming to mind. But <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to go back to something that you said there at the beginning, which is noticing and recognizing that there were people in your family who couldn't hold space for the truth. Mm-hmm. Man, that's mm-hmm. a really powerful way of saying that. And. Mm. And then you said, you know, for a lot of different reasons. And I'm thinking it doesn't necessarily have to be specific to your family members, but let's talk a little bit about what some of those reasons, those common reasons are. Because mm. I think there's a lot of people who don't know, like, what it, what is actually going on and what some of those limitations might be. And it might be helpful mm. for us to just itemize that or bullet point it a little bit mm. so that people can kind of wrap So I to just itemize that or bullet point it a little bit. Mm. So that people can kind of wrap their head around, well, what are those kinds of reasons? Why, you know, because there is that sense of like, how is that possible? How can someone who like is supposed to be my parent or a family member, you know, mm-hmm. deny me or dismiss me in this mm-hmm. way? So mm-hmm. what are, what are to, to your mind, are some of the common reasons why that happens? So I, the first reason is, I, I, and I may be repeating myself, is I think this truth, is too big for some people to hold mm-hmm. for yeah. whatever reason, okay? So let's take my brother. Um, it, what's ironic is he had a very troublesome relationship with my father, our father. 
Um, and one would think this gives you a, one would think this gives you a great reason to say, I'm done with you. I don't, mm-hmm. I never, I had a hard time mm-hmm. with you anyway, and now this is a good reason. But he never did any work at coming to any kind of resolution about his own relationship with our father. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that kind of, he's kind of wrapped in that. And then I come out and say the big truth, and that's just more than he can handle. Yeah, right. See? Yeah. Now, this, is, this story is almost 30 years old of my brother not being able to handle it. Wow. Um, I don't think I could have articulated this back then. I know mm-hmm. I couldn't have. I was mm-hmm. just too blown away by the fact that my little brother was, not standing up for was was not standing with me with you, know you I mean? yeah not that's right supporting me well it's, it was awful but it, it's what happened it, it's where he was at in his own yeah. growth and development and his own humanity where he was at why he couldn't relate yeah. to it why he yeah. couldn't accept it um and you know for my yeah oh go please go ahead no no no, no. So you were asking about the different responses. So yeah. The uh, so the other. I mean, we were a small family. It was myself, my brother, my mother, and my father. So I mean, we have extended family, but that's not as important. I mean, it's when it's your nuclear family that yeah. can't handle it that makes it so painful. Um, and my mother, who was a non-offending parent, she was a bystander. She knew some of the abuse, probably not all of it, but mm-hmm. she knew enough to know her little girl was being harmed fashion. Um, but the way my mother has would cope throughout her life is to sort of stay stand in the middle. If, uh, how can I say this? When it all came out and uh, my father was confronted by my brother, my father said, I don't remember ever doing such a thing. Mm. And this is not an uncommon response. No, Sometimes yeah. it's even more harsh that, mm-hmm. no, I never did it, they're lying. But it, he, he did this sort of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous way, but I can't remember, so I, you know, I can't say oh, I didn't. You know, yeah. Anyway, so mm. my mother's response was, I believe the both of you. I know, Donna, you wouldn't lie about such a thing. And your father had some blackout times, so I believe the both of you. So, which was like a nothing for me. Yeah, um, Very, it's too neutral. So, yeah. But that's, that's how she coped with life in general about all things that, you yeah. know, were stressful. Yeah. So I would say when you're approaching, you know, any survivor that's approaching looking at doing this, you need to know that your family is probably, people that are in the family are probably going to react to this the way they would any other traumatic, upsetting piece of information. Hmm. Whether it's through defensiveness or denial or... yeah. We know our family people, mm-hmm. and yeah. I want to say, don't be surprised about whatever happens. You know? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> and be well prepared, like kind of think through. Well, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. be very yeah. well prepared. But um, yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of brings to mind that something that you know I think is going on for people is that it really requires. You know, I think is going on for people is that it really requires them to to. Uh, shift the way they perceive or relate to uh, this other person, you know. Uh, They now have to begin thinking about this person as, oh, this is my husband and somebody who abused my child. And that is like, whoa, I mean, you know, that just, it's tough. You know, it's not excusing that, but yeah, Yeah. Yeah. very few people have the capacity, I guess, is what we're saying at the end of the day. So. Right. That doesn't mean don't tell. I mean, and don't bring no. this forward to your family, but right. have a plan. And right. that brings me to the second thing that I was really connecting to, with it, which is, you know, when that family isn't there for you, we have this mm. opportunity to build a family of choice. I love that. Yep. 
Mm -hmm. Are there any specific, you know, for some people they would say, well, you know, shit, if I can't even trust the people who are supposed to love me, you know, and protect Mm. me and take care of me. Uh, It's like, it's trust people and, and, and even like take the steps that I need to take in order to build a family of choice. Um, I agree. Can you talk with us a little bit about mm-hmm. that? Yeah. What do you, sure. What do you think about sure. That? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I say you, you said take the steps. I agree, and those steps are baby steps. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, it's one little step at a time. Uh, it's like it, it's building a relationship wherever it is. It takes time to get to know people, to see where they can, where where you can in, uh, in, be trustful. Mm. Where you can, I always say when I when I when I'm trying to when I attempt building a, a close relationship over the years, I do the things I wish they would do for me. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like li- listening really well to someone, to someone showing up when there's something that's sad that happens in their life, and if I do that, and then. Something turns around, and that's what I'm needing, and it doesn't come back. I know that's probably not a person I want to pull in real close. Ooh, I like that. So mm-hmm. I intentionally work at being the friend I want to be, and if it comes back, then that's exactly – then I grab a hold, and I don't let go of that person. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're mine. <laughs> I mean, I have, I have friends that I've had since I was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. And all the way, I have friends that um, were parents uh, with me when we we had our kids in preschool. Yeah, I was just with them last week when I was down in Florida. So it is very possible to build long, deep, lasting. Yeah, we have to show up and be there and ask for what we need. Absolutely, love that. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you, because one of the traps that I see um, survivors fall into is, you know, so you, you have a mom or you have a father who mm. is just not been there for you or, you know, or they've mm-hmm. actively abused you and it leaves mm-hmm. this kind of gap. It leaves this longing, you know, like this feeling of mm-hmm. like, I've never had a mom, right? Mm-hmm. Or I've never had mm-hmm. this or that or the other. And, you know, I, I find survivors sometimes get very stuck in that. You know, just mm. spending their lives lamenting and um, and upset and mm. hurting over right. the fact that right. this was the case. Uh, and right. I understand it, but I also, yep. you know, want to free people from it because, goodness gracious, mm-hmm. you know, we don't want to spend the rest of our lives in mourning, really. Right. So yep. how did you make your peace with that? You know, how did you make your peace with that? You know, how did you come to that place where you no longer felt wounded or hurt? because of Mm. the responses of your family? Well, uh, there's a couple things I want to say. First of all is it's a long process. And one part of it is letting go of wishing my mother would be the mother she wasn't. Mm. Mm -hmm. And also I spent a lot of writing time asking the question, why didn't my mother protect me? It was a big question in my life. Um, and I wrote for over a year. That's practically the only subject I wrote about. And this wow. is just for my own personal writing. Yeah. But uh, a sort of medicinal kind of writing that you kind of work through something. And, uh, and I, what I finally realized is I can't, I can't answer that question. My mother's the only person that can answer that question, but she would have, there's the only person that can answer that question, but she would have to do a whole lot of, personal work before she could get to the answer of that question Mm -hmm. herself so there's that there's the letting go of the yearning for the mother to be different that that had I had to do that work and then I'm going to say something a little weird maybe but I came to understand that I had to mother myself yeah because I also I did also spend a bunch of time looking for a mother another mother Mm, yeah, um, and you, you really can't. I think you can find per, people that are from the older generation that can be fabulous um, 
uh, mentors and mm-hmm. care caregivers and wise ones to turn to. But I can't, you know, physically yes. done. Yeah. And that took grieving. You know, you have to go through a whole, you know, process, a healing process of grieving what you lo- what you never had, what you're never going to get, um, till I got to a point of accepting that I was born to a family where my mother, I had a mother that couldn't protect me and a father that harmed me. And there's a lot of reasons why they did that. And that's, that's what that is. And now, what kind of mothering do I need going forward? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And, and, and you know, you know all those tools, all the self care stuff that you you got to employ, and, yeah. and choices to make that I'm not going to overextend myself because you know a good mother would say, "Don't overextend yourself," you know, or whatever. Right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes. Right. Like giving yourself motherly advice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Now I also I- think. Okay. Oh, yeah. Please. Um, I, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Now I also I, think. Okay. Oh, yeah. Please. Um, I I I just want to say that being a part of the second wave of the women's movement was also very healing for me because mm-hmm. we really worked hard to be supportive to one another to claim who we were as women and that we have certain rights and that we have skills and gifts and so forth. Yeah. And we did a lot, of, and there's a big chunk of my book is about that. Um, that, that. That was part of my process, too. My I love process. that. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it is amazing that, we, you know, we, we do have this opportunity to, first of all, you know, mother ourselves or whatever the relationship mm-hmm. is that we miss, mm-hmm. right? Whether mm-hmm. that be nurturing right, right. or protection, right, right. whatever we didn't yep. get. Um, mm-hmm. And that we can find mentors and others who, mm-hmm. um, yep. yeah, I, I agree with what you said about we don't want to try to replace or make somebody yeah. take the role of. Um, so yeah. it's one piece really, you know, exactly that, at coming into a place of acceptance. Okay, this is how it is. And right. grieving that, moving through that, but getting to the other side of it, right, so that you're not mm-hmm. stuck in grieving. You don't want to spend your life right. grieving. No, that. God. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, I agree. When yeah. you think back on, on your journey uh, mm-hmm. and of healing, what would you say are some of your like greatest wins? Like those things where you're like, man, mm. look at me, <laughs> look at what I just did there. <laughs> well, I do think, as I was saying about the women's move before, um, getting involved in social action, mm. you know, social change, yeah. whatever, whatever the whatever the issue is about, it almost doesn't matter because there's so much injustice. Other place to incest and child sexual abuse. It's such an unjust thing to be able to step into another place where you're working for justice for others. Um, It just, it has a ripple effect for feeling and getting a sense of justice by doing Mm. social change work. Um, Mm. And like I said, it doesn't, It doesn't matter almost what the issue is about. It's about standing up for something. It's about righting some wrongs. Um, There's no question that that was a big, big help for me. Um, Man, I just got goosebumps, Donna, because (laughs) this question of justice is one that often comes up. And I just, what Mm. what popped in my mind as you were saying that was like justice by proxy. (laughs) Yes. Like, oh oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. yeah, like, yes, yeah. there are some, like, for some of us, there's not, we're, our personal justice, it's just not going to happen, mm-hmm. right? Right. Uh, yeah. For whatever reasons, but boy, well, we could go out over. there and we, yeah. yeah, right. We could advocate for others. We could seek justice mm-hmm. for others. Yeah. Man, that's powerful. What a, what really a wonderful is. insight. Yeah. I love yeah, that. I'll take it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the other thing that comes to mind when I hear that is just, you know, we can, Boy, we're so good at just like sitting in our stuff, right? Mm, <laughs> and that's I think for it can sure. be really powerful to just, you know, fine. So you're, in, you know, you're in recovery. You've got things that are working, mm-hmm. but get out mm-hmm. into the world, do something that's mm-hmm. of service, and absolutely, right. that can be so healing. 
Um, yep. To, on, just on that level of Absolutely. being engaged, being out in the world, giving back, and getting, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it, it might sound harsh, but, you know, get out of get out of yourself for a second, you know? <laughs> like, exactly. More than just what's going on for you. Yeah. Right, right. And then I also yeah. think we can, we, we can, I think it's, it's a, part of the nature of our trauma to feel isolated because our right. harm happened in isolation. Right. So I think whenever we stay alone, you know, like you say, sort of steeping in it, or I forget what word you use, but um, that, that just increases our sense of isolation. Yes. And it's, yeah. it's really a, a, an awful place to be of feeling mm-hmm. all alone. Like mm-hmm. we don't belong to anybody or anywhere so that again, taking some kind of social action work, whatever it's about, it does get you unisolated. Yep. You yep. Know? So wow, beautiful. So, folks, a little mini challenge for all of you: think about one thing mm. you can do this month. You know, to go. Out, mm. You can do this month. You know, to go out and yeah. be of service, and it doesn't have to be a big organization. It could be like helping no. a neighbor, right, or whatever Absolutely. the case is. But. Uh, mm-hmm. That's my little mini challenge to all of you listeners out there. <laughs> well, I, 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 you got my vote on that one, Rachel. Right on. That's a great <laughs> idea. Yep. Yeah, right yep. on. So as we start to wrap up today, um, hmm. is there anything else that you uh, really want to speak to or, you know, share with our listeners? Hmm. Let me see. I think th- the one thing I want to underscore is, um, do not bother with anybody that talks to you about forgiving your offender. Mm. Yeah, can you um, break that down for us? Yeah, a little bit. Because, um, first of all, forgiveness is a two-way street. And unless your offender is, and unless your offender is ready to confess, repent, and give some restitution for what they've done, don't even go there. Mm. Then it's not about forgiveness. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot, I think a lot of people end up inadvertently guilt tripping us that we can't move on until we forgive our offenders. Right, right. And yeah. I, I think that's absolutely incorrect. Yeah, know? yeah. I think um, there's so much more work for us to be doing, so many positive things, directions for us to move in mm-hmm. our healing. Mm-hmm. that um, unless your offender is, is one that's really to really do the forgiveness dance, you know, in all its layers, yeah. I would say, let it go, let it go. Yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah. You know, I'm, I I find myself often of in, in two camps when it comes to this topic, because when it comes to this topic, because oh. um, for me, that word was so triggering. And so in my uh-huh. healing, what I really spent time doing was looking at the root of that word and what it really represents. Mm. And oh, yeah. when I came across the, the Hebrew translation of that word, which is to send mm. away, mm-hmm. that for me like clicked some things really into place. I was like, oh, forgiveness is just about sending away. <laughs> So great. I love I'm sending it. away this person. I'm sending away the pain. I'm sending away right. the past. I'm sending away, you know, my beliefs and my, you know, the lies right. that I took on because of this. And right. because I agree that at the end of the day, this really has nothing to do with the other person. There can nope. be, you know, uh, exchanges between um, an, an abuser and the abused where it really is uh, that two-way street that that mm-hmm. person rarely that, yeah. you know, that we yeah. have to find a way of, you know, being able to move on uh, from mm-hmm. the past. And yep. so for me, that's really, forgiveness is just that moment of going, you know what, your choices and your decisions and your actions are no longer a part of who I am or no longer right. of like a part of my life and going to impact me. I'm going to send that away. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's great. I yeah, love it. I'm, yeah. I'm stealing that. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome to do so. <laughs> Yay. Yes. Okay. And I also want to reiterate, for some people like to just say, like, I do not have to forgive. That is so freeing. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. it is so powerful. 
Um, yep. That it, yeah, thank you for bringing that forward because it mm. is such an important piece. And I think it does yeah. give us that room to go out and do a lot of the things that we've been talking about today, right? Mm-hmm, when we mm-hmm. stop holding, you know, or stop holding right. on to things, we can go out, we can build that family of choice. We can go out Absolutely. and be of service to others. And we can go out mm-hmm. and create the things in our lives that we really want to create, just like you have with, oh, my goodness, yes. these workshops and the book and the mm-hmm. advocacy work that you do. Uh, so I want to just say thank you, Donna, for um, oh. being a badass and for <laughs> all of the... <laughs> For all of the um, healing that you bring um, to those who who find you and find mm. your work, so, so much, um, Rachel. yeah, absolutely. And I want all of you listening to go check out uh, Donna's website, time to tell dot org. There are so yep. many beautiful resources there. You can find out about her workshops. You can purchase her book, Healing My Life from Incest to Joy, right there on the website. And mm-hmm. also feel free to Joy right there on the website. And mm-hmm. also feel free to reach out to her uh, directly. Her email is yeah Donna Jensen. That's D O N N A J E N S O N eight the number eight at gmail dot mm-hmm. com. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, any final words for our listeners today? Rachel, you are wonderful. Oh, and goodness. You are such Thank a great you. resource to our community. I'm just thrilled to have been on your show. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> no. mm. Oh, you're getting me all emotional. <laughs> well, I oh, adore you. <laughs> and Yay. I'm just... So happy to have had this time with you today as well. And for everybody mm-hmm. listening, thank you for joining us and, and tuning in. I hope you'll take a, take on the little mini challenges that we've talked about here today. And I also welcome you to visit my, my website, rachelgrantcoaching.com, to learn more. Subscribe to the podcast and leave us a comment if you're liking, if you're liking what you're hearing. And then join us again next time. And until then, take really good care of you.